people find it difficult to trust people. If you start with low trust, you create an environment where that's reconfirmed. There's a lot of research that says that people are more productive at home. The idea that there is a drift back is an illusion. You're the CEO of your career, right? Rather than complain, do something about it. I'm 42. Most people my age have a mid-career crisis. Yet. Work on your relationships. Relationships is essential to a good job. Evan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for joining me. It's a pleasure. Good to be here. Lovely. What's that picture in the background there? Um, that is um, uh, a punk artist uh, called Mr. Brainwash, who I've been following for a while. And that was his coronation picture. So it looks reasonably traditional. But when you get up front, he's wearing all kind of punk badges from the 1970s. And like, spit Love it. Like that, so. <laughs> love it. A little bit of street art. I like that. Street art, yeah. Pop street art. I love it. Well, no, thanks for joining me. When are you going to kind of like give me give us a two minute, like who you are? What you, what you know, background. I know you've got a book you've just you've just um, just published. But just you know, for, for those who don't know you, if you give it okay. a few minutes. So um, right. my background is uh, kind of fairly traditional corporate one that, that kind of that went a bit wild. So I started off in industrial relations HR. Uh, then I joined Mars, the confectionery and pet food business. I started in HR. Uh, then I came up with all these ideas for the factory and the CEO said, well, if you're that smart, why don't you go and run the factory and show us how it's done? So I moved into manufacturing, uh, loved manufacturing, managing lots of people, but my sales forecast was often a mess, which it is in a lot of organizations. Right. So I complained bitterly about sales forecast. So they made me head of strategic planning and uh, forecasting and all that kind of stuff. Uh, then I moved out to France and I headed up a learning and development organization. At the time when we went into Eastern Europe, so I was one of the first people into Poland, Russia, Hungary, Czech Republic, places like that, helping set up the new businesses and taking people from communism to, to being Martians uh, in nice. as, as short Com period as possible. The, jo the journey from communism to capitalism. Absolutely, like yeah. And, and, you know, fantastic time because uh, I met a lot of entrepreneurs. Yeah. Things were kind of really fluid. And at that time, everyone who worked for me was working remotely. They were working in right. a matrix organization. They were working across cultures. And I thought, well, we should get some training on this. Um, and there wasn't any, basically. There was just some early work on, on managing cultural differences. Um, but after complaining for about six months, I realized there wasn't anything. And so I, I actually ran what I think is the world's first ever uh, remote teams training program 30 years ago this April. So, wow. we were, you know, that was, uh, and of course, after COVID, that's now an overnight success. So, uh, I'm trying to do the maths. 94, 94. <laughs> 94 was the first one, yeah. Uh, and of course, there wasn't uh, was it the the alternatives were email, phone, or get on a plane at the time. So you didn't have the yeah, yeah. These kind of video tools and things like that. So fantastic. And then since then, I've been working with large multinationals around the world on matrix management, remote and hybrid working, and and increasingly, and that's what the new book's about. How do we find purpose in a very complex world of work? Fine, I love that. Love that. And when did you? So when did you make that kind of transition from corporate? life to because you, you made it right so, and then to, to writing the book and consulting and so forth yeah it was 1994 so basically i was living in france i was traveling like crazy i was averaging three countries a week and thinking this is crazy uh, and everybody around me was living that life and i thought well there must be a need for these skills and and once i had the idea i was pretty confident and i actually went uh, back in those days the the companies that were really hot and everyone was talking about were people like abb uh motorola hewlett packard and they were my first three customers. So I, I literally yeah. knocked on their doors and said, you know, do you do team building? Yeah. Are your teams international and distributed? Yes. Does your team building training reflect that? No. Would you like it to? So it was a kind of very, yeah, it was kind of a bit yeah, what yeah. I call a better mousetrap sale. And so, you know, early days, yeah. we got a lot of traction very quickly. I love that. There's many, many leaders I speak to that they're in this like remote, they have remote distributed teams. They're used to managing leading people yeah. that they can see. Any, any kind of tips and strategies? It's amazing this has been going on for so long, right? And still, I think people people that I speak to, certainly in a leadership role, for some reason, people are, they're not confident or they don't feel comfortable like saying that they are struggling or that they need more help or training, certainly to their to their leaders. Any, any tips and strategies for folks that are, are finding it tough? Yeah, um, trust, you, trust your people. I mean, I, 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 the I'm not joking yeah. about getting straight to no. the point because for 30 years, you know, pre-COVID, the biggest barrier to adopting remote working is line managers not trusting their people to be productive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and since COVID, it's the people who've got, in my opinion, a lot, you know, okay, if you're running a factory, you need people back in the factory. But for a lot of office-based roles, 
you look at the kind of industries where people really struggle with that and often they're high control environments yeah no, that's true. Right. There's, you know, there's all also the evidence shows, by the way, that people are more productive when they work remotely. Not everybody; they'll always be poor performers, but for the for on average, people are more productive. Yeah, I mean, this is obviously we're talking about office-based workers. I mean, if you're in a factory, hospital, and stuff, absolutely. But I think that's that that's the crux of it. Is mostly people feel find it difficult to trust people because you have this classic earn my trust. Yeah, you know, there's this been this classic thing of like you know earn my trust and then. I'll give you more responsibility. I'll sure. give you some, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you've got but, two, but you're right. You've got two possibilities, Lewis. I mean, one is the earn your trust, which says, I start with low trust. Now show it to me. Now the risk is that if you start with low trust, you create an environment where that's reconfirmed, you know? Whereas if you start with high trust, occasionally you're going to be disappointed. But most of the time, people are going to live up to that and, and you've saved yourself a lot of time. So I would say, you know, earning trust is, is hard to do remotely. Um, and there's things you can do to construct opportunities to build trust. But, you know, trust is made up of two things. One is capability. Can you do the work? And that's not so hard to evaluate remotely. But the other is character. You know, how do you do it? And that's a bit more tangible. And doing that remotely yeah, takes yeah. a lot more time. Yeah. It's also recruiting the right folks. Simon Sinek does this wonderful grid. I think it was the, you probably know, the ex-army thing. It's like will and skill, you know. Yeah. And, you know, the idea is to hire someone who's high will, high skill. But you'd much rather have someone high will, medium to low skill than high skill, low will, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you get the recruiting right and you trust people off the bat and have ways to measure outcomes, because I also think there's a mind, should be a mindset shift to, you know, rather than time spent, outcomes. Yeah. And that mindset shift is quite difficult, I think, for people it, to get it, their heads around. I, I, I don't hold myself up as a paradigm on that because I'm, I'm the opposite. Oh. I'm... I'm I set up the business because I am very passionate about autonomy. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm, I realized all the stress in my life. In was, what way? In what way? Just, uh, just uh, all, all stress in my life was caused by other people asking me to do things that I didn't want to do. So <laughs> I, I think I <laughs> technically unmanageable, you know, and and, uh, and so I kind of assume everyone else is the same. So I don't closely manage people I, I hire what i think are really good people and i give them tremendous amount of autonomy and you know a couple of times during my career that's caused me a problem but 95 percent of the time that's got me some great people who get on with things and i'm a yorkshireman as well so i always work on the basis that you know if i pay your salaries and doing your job that's probably not going to be a great idea not great not great I used to live in Leeds. I had a Yorkshire accent back in the day. I moved go. down to London and they uh, they beat it out of me. <laughs> Mine's gone completely as well. <laughs> I love that. Um, they're super interesting. I mean, it's it's certainly something that the, the work from home, remote work, coming to the office. I mean, that whole stuff is uh, is crazy. And I, and I think the other the other thing I'm hearing a lot is um, and, and you, know, you mentioned research. Um, you know, there's a lot of research that that says that people are more productive at home. Um, you see research that people, I, I don't know, it's ebbs and flows, you never quite know. But certainly one thing's true is that a lot of folks are really quite happy working remotely or working from anywhere, let's say. Um, and and a lot of companies now, certainly the bigger firms, financial services, legal, tech, are starting to want people back in um, and, 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 and mandating, right? Like yeah. three days, four days and stuff like that. No, is that what, I, what is your view on it? Yeah. I think firstly, and secondly, just one one follow up mm-hmm. question to that is: if you're a leader, asking your team back, that's a hard spot to be in. Um, and what you know, how would you kind of deal with that? Yeah, I think first of all, the the idea that there is a drift back is an illusion. Uh, there are, there is no drift, illusion. drift back. It's it's been plateaued for about two years now. Um, so, in in what way? What do you mean? Uh, just... There's no more people going into an office than did in the past. Right. Uh, what you see uh, regularly is surveys um, saying that companies are doing that and press reports because it, it makes good news. Uh, but it, either it's the it's the it's the same culprits, you know, it's the banks who want their people back in for investment banking trading flaws, which is you know it, it's a valid choice from their point of view. Um, or it seems to be surveys that uh, if you look carefully, are sponsored by the real estate industry or. or sandwich shops or something like that who've got a big interest in getting you back into the office as does yeah. government because that's how they get a lot of their tax revenues so i I, I don't see any objective ev- evidence there's a few people who track it you know pretty seriously that it's that people are coming back more often so that's okay. so the first thing is do you that think, I think then 
so the reality you think then is um so we had covid obviously things changed yeah. and we've kind of plateaued into whatever works for certain companies and you think that's that's been the status quo for the last couple of years I think so. Yeah, there's very little evidence that it's changing, and also, you know, the cat's out of the bag. I, I remember during the, you know, it's, during the pandemic, we all had a lot of time to read, didn't we? And uh, so I was kind of busily reading everything I could see about what's the impact of this. And there was a, an article by the Economist about a month in, and they said, when you have a major change like this, things that make your life easier, that reduce friction, tend to stick. And things that don't, people swing back. I remember thinking, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and the, the cat's out of the bag on home working. You know, if you're a parent, if you've got a long commute, if you've got a lousy office, all those kind of things, why would you want to go into it? Um, you know, I, I've run my business completely remotely for 30 years. Uh, we have a small office, which I describe as a kind of management drop-in center, where uh, and right. people go there once a month. Uh, and it's largely storage and, and meeting rooms for what we want to use it. Um, so I know it works. Yeah. Um, but there still is that kind of, there are some valid, not so much objections, but concerns, things like, you know, how do we stay creative? How do we build relationships? How do we train young people in particular? But I think all those are soluble. Uh, and the, the disappointment for me about hybrid working, which is that mixture of, of remote and in the office, is that people have moved to the pattern without really thinking through the consequences of it. You know, because if you don't manage the consequences, like proximity bias is a big one, you know, that tendency to overvalue the things that you see. Yes, that's a problem, yeah. but only if you evaluate the people the way you used to. But why would you do that you know, when you've made a major change? So you've got to tweak everything. You've got to tweak the yeah. way you lead, the way you collaborate, the way you run meetings. All of that stuff needs to be adapted. Not 100 percent, but a little bit. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I mean, you've got to do what's right for your business. But for me, the important thing, I think, is, is make sure you communicate it. So people can choose whether or not that's the right environment for them. Yep. You know, whether it's like Elon Musk style 24 seven in the office or sure. something fully remote, like your business and actually my business, you know, where you're working at home or a local coffee shop or whatever it might be. Um, and that's well, something I'm really. Just Sorry, going no? back to what you said about factories and, uh, and, you know, restaurants and places that have got a physical location. Um, I think that's the next wave of flexibility. I, we're already seeing that in our clients that people are saying, well, why not make, uh, and so, you know, maybe one of the problems with with retail recruitment at the moment is that people have got options which give them more flexibility. So even if, you know, we, we've got, would you believe, a Guatemalan client who runs restaurants right. and all kinds of physical, and they're looking quite closely at how do we give whatever flexibility we can to those people as well. So can we be more flexible on shift patterns? Can we allow people to swap patterns if it helps their family? You know, if you have to go into a, a factory is there two days a month that you could work from home doing development stuff? And so anything you can do that gives people flexibility helps you win. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it could certainly make, make you keep your team in a, in a, in a competitive industry like that, where people are trying to poach folks, the tenure is quite low. Yeah, uh, Absolutely. But there's still this, this thing of like, you know, retail restaurants, it's an experience. We, mm -hmm. we like, we like experiences, you know? And, and so I think if, if you're in that industry, I mean, you, you resign yourself to the fact that you're going in. What's quite difficult, I think, I was speaking to colleagues in New York, uh, I've got a few colleagues in New York, and they, they tra if they travel into the city, it could cost them easily $100 plus dollars a day to go in. But if you're working in a coffee shop or a restaurant, I mean, you can't afford to spend 100 either. So you've got to rely on workers that are living in city, yeah. um, you know, which is really difficult. Sure, and there will be less of those. You know, but on the other hand, yeah. you know, I live in a small village, 45, 50 miles west of London, where a lot of people used to commute. Uh, boy, you should see how the coffee shops are booming in the village these days. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's flipped completely. It's, I agree. You know, it used to be. In a different place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like, we, we used to have, like, this is where we live, and the local coffee shops, restaurants, I mean, kind of, you know, no, no, no trade. You go into London and it's booming. I remember the sandwich shops pre-COVID were licensed to print money. They they use around the block and and stuff. And and you're right, it's completely it's completely shifted now. Um, which so, is, you know, is I, I, it looks as though people are, are living further away. I saw some data from the US that shows that the average distance of new hires from work is now twice what it used to be. Um, we we've got family friends who used to live in Reading and travel into London. Now she works uh, remotely. She lives in North Yorkshire. She comes in three times a month to London on the train. It takes two and a half hours. You know, doesn't matter if you're only doing it three times a month, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. 
what I'd like to what I'd like to get your thoughts on is so we we talked a bit about the company, right? And creating flexible working patterns and stars. I'm really interested also in the individual because I hear you hear a lot of, you know, them shoot people shooting up at the company, right? Yeah. Um but I, I think for me, like a big thing I'm, I'm a proponent of is taking responsibility for yourself, right? Like treating, almost treating your career like, you know, you're, you're the CEO of your career, right? Um, and rather than complain, do something about it. Um, and just kind of, you know, what, what are your thoughts on this? You know, like the people that they're stuck in a job or they're in a job where they're moaning about the commute or they're doing the three, four days. Um, so just into your thoughts on that. Um, and also... Also, following on to on from that, I think there's a lot of things that people need to do in a remote environment, certainly around building relationships with people yeah. and le- leaning in, which I think people are missing a little bit. Yeah. So the in terms of technology, absolutely. I, I think all of our work, whether it's remote or matrix management, whatever, starts from the position yeah. of you as an individual, not complaining about the system, but you know, taking ownership for your own clarity, your own performance. Uh, and I think after COVID, a tremendous number of people were thinking about what's my purpose, what is work for? And it almost became yeah. fashionable. It still is a little bit, isn't it? Fashionable to, to you know, quiet quitting. You know, that yeah. that makes me furious as an idea. Yeah. Why? Well, the idea that by doing a little bit less and not caring about it so much, my life is going to get better. That doesn't work in any area of life, right? right? And so I, I see this kind of engagement of work as a, yes, it's a corporate issue. And corporate spend literally billions of dollars every year on employee engagement and they do a survey and they come up with lots of actions and then they beat up the leaders and the hr managers to to engage people well you can't engage someone else you can create an environment but they have to engage themselves so as an individual you know most of us spend about 40 percent of our waking lives for 40 years at work so if we're not happy at work that is not a leadership problem that's a me problem right that is a my life problem and so waiting for your leader to kind of solve that for you or hr to come up with the latest program seems crazy to me so you yeah. know when i after covid i was also thinking about this you know I, i'm coming up to the age when people traditionally retire and i was thinking about you know what do i do with the second half of my life you know and, uh, uh, really thinking through this area of how do you choose the things that really give you engagement and make you satisfied uh, and I ended up writing the, the book, Find Your Purpose, okay. around that, because I found everyone is in, in transition. My, my daughter's coming back from maternity leave. My son's thinking about the next step of his career. My friends are thinking about retirement. And, you know, we don't get a guide on how to navigate that. You know, And so we right. kind of make these these literally life-altering choices um, based on what? You know, just retirement, you know, as one aspect of that. 90% of people in the UK retire with a financial plan. Only 10% have a plan on how they're going to spend their time. Wow. And it is important to have the finances, but most of my friends who've retired, at, you know, six months in, are going, what am I going My to dad do? said the same thing at six months, yeah. and he went and he went back and did something else. A lot, and... a lot of people went back to work, yeah. So it's yeah, interesting, isn't went... it? So we, we moan about work, but also it, it's a source of great fulfillment, right? And uh, there's, there's some research by a Hungarian um psychologist whose name I won't attempt to, to pronounce. His first name is Mikhail. And he, he wrote a book about flow. Uh, and he looked, he asked people over a period of time and monitored, how do you feel at various times in your life? And, and flow is that sense of what you're, you're, you're focused, you're achieving things, time seems to fa- pa- pass really quickly. Uh, and he found that people experience flow at work about four times more often than, than during leisure. Uh, and if you think about what people do in leisure, we spend in the UK, we spend about 22 hours a week sitting in front of the screen with, you know, is that engaging? Is that fun? You know, no, so we never, I mean, thought, you want to feel... we never thought how to do leisure. No, but you know, you want to feel, you want to feel productive. You want to do stuff. Um, but you know, you're right. A lot of people don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm 42 and most people my age have a mid-career crisis. Yet. <laughs> you're like 42 to 45, right? Because you've already been working for 20 years. Yeah, and, and you, another you know, thirty like people, before you can retire, Lewis. Another thirty. Thank you for making me feel better than I already feel. <laughs> and uh, luckily, I mean, luckily, I would say, luckily, I really enjoy what I do. Um, but but this is my point. It's like most people don't speak about it. I spoke to, I was speaking to a couple of friends like privately, right? No one speaks about this, and and it's a big thing, you know. It's like because you're right, work is the thing you do most in your life, and when you hit a, a plateau or, or you're not, you haven't found something that you enjoy. 
it's really it's hard to get up out of bed they're not looking forward to monday they can't wait for friday to come around and it's not a good way to to no. live but the other thing is there's also a lot of you know we, we talk about a lot you know find your passion it's important to be happy and then if you're not it puts a lot of pressure on people and you're like you know people are like well, i need to yeah. need to find my you know but they don't know how to do it no, and i think that's don't. a huge yeah and you know what i think it starts with meaning you know so uh, and i read a lot of, you know whenever i get interested in something it's if I behind me I, I kind of read everything that, that's ever been written on the subject literally I must have read 100 books on this subject and um, they all say you know find your purpose but how do you find your purpose and so yeah yeah i think my contribution was as a trainer to say well do this you know and what i i started thinking about purpose and i thought it's just too big a question to, what is your life's purpose it's a massive question and so in the book we come at it from different different levels so what are my strengths what am i good at and enjoy doing what are my passions is there anything that really engages me and makes me feel passionate if not just things i really enjoy uh, and thirdly what are my values what do i believe in and once you clear about those things you can start then to kind of sneak up on your purpose you know so why am i here so what am i here to do and why you know and those yeah. are the big i i have it stuck on the side of my my office wall it becomes like a like a compass a north star that says if I if I do things that move me in that direction, I'm likely to be engaged. It's likely to be my balance. Yeah. It's likely to be amongst my strengths. Uh, and if I'm not, then let's do something else. And so I think yeah. it starts with understanding what gives you meaning. Yeah. Also, I think to just follow on to that, because I speak to a lot of folks who want to transition to a different career. Yeah. And also, you know, it can be a few steps to get there, right? Like yeah. it doesn't have to be, you know, your next step might not necessarily be that thing. But, it, but as long as it's taking you towards it, I think that's important. Because especially if you're, you know, in mid 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 career, let's say, and you're earning money and you have financial responsibilities, and you know, you 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 feel that you can't just yeah. you know, take a pay cut or sack it all in, and you, you know, so maybe it's even you know smaller steps. I think mm -hmm. is is a good way. To I think, think even it. within your existing job, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of job crafting. You know, job crafting says, you know, let let's work on three things. First of all, the tasks. Second, the relationships, and third, my attitude. So. There's always tasks that you can re-engineer or, or get rid of, or, or you know, one of the things I often did in my career just stop doing stuff. You know, I, I, when, I remember as a, as a new trainee, I was given all of the government reporting to do for this role, and it was a pain. And I spent yeah. hours and hours on it. And I thought, what if I just don't do it? So I just stopped doing it because it was all external reporting, and 90% of it, no one ever followed up. So okay, so that didn't matter. And then the 10%, I would always ask them, so. Do I have to do this? And they would say, well, no, but we like people to do it. Okay, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so, uh, anything yeah, yeah. that's bringing you down, that's sucking your energy, you know, try and re engineer it. Or with AI coming along, there'll be a lot of opportunities to do that going forward. Yeah, yeah. So anything, yeah, that's true. Work on your relationships. You know, relationships is, is essential to a good job. So spend less time with the people who are paying and more time with the people who give you energy. Uh, and finally, work yeah. on your mindset because if your mindset is, you know, works a drag, quiet quitting, dying to go home, then you're priming your mind to look for the negatives and you will find it. But if you see yeah. work as a, as a challenge, an opportunity to grow and learn, you'll also find those things. So I think you can, you know, and if you can change one hour of your week from something you really don't like to something you enjoy, then why not two? Why not five? You know, and so just keep pushing in the direction that gives you meaning. Brilliant advice. Brilliant advice. I think it's, it's so important because, you know, you can... You know, this is classic, right? Like you can focus on the things you can control, you know, forget the rest. But being you know, a lot of people I speak with, they're, they're always looking to blame oh. something. It's it's the manager, it's the it's the company, it's the you know economy, whatever it might be. Just fill in fill in the blank, right? Yeah. But but to your point, like you're right, you can you can create a lot, a lot of the time a job that suits you. Mm -hmm. You can build the right relationships internally if you lean in. You know, like build relationships, like network internally, yep. externally. You know, these are some of the things that you can do really easily nowadays with all the different bits of tech yep. and LinkedIn and messaging and yeah, yep. much easier, I think, than it was. Yeah. You know, one of the other things around relationships is try and connect with the people who, who use the service or product you produce. There's a tremendous amount yeah. of meaning in seeing the impact that what you do has on others. You know, and, and so that's, you know, even whether it's yeah. customers, whether it's the next step in the internal chain that you're working in, that could be real helpful as well. Yeah. Also, I can't tell you how many people I speak with. I ask them, well, how did you, you know, how did you make 
get that job or why did you make that move? My old boss took me. Yeah. I used to work with him on my old team, yeah. you know, and, and, and then that happens to a real thing and the job doesn't go to market, you know, they yeah. didn't advertise it or it didn't go to a recruiter, but yeah. they had a great relationship um, that that person put the work in, right? They were, they were like, had the, the trust to, mm-hmm. to, you know, to, to go back to your original point and they're the people that people want on their team. Yep, no, yeah. absolutely. As I, I think that's essentially the, the second part of your, your question that kind of set us off on this was about when you're working remotely, you know, one of the things that you need to do differently. Yes. And I think that kind of relationship building, you know, people, I think there's a lot of mythology about the old water cooler thing. You know, when we're in the office, we kind of bumped into each other in the water cooler. We had these fantastic ideas. Um, yeah. Not very often, if we're honest, right? Usually we just got some water or, or a coffee or whatever. Uh, and there's actually quite a lot of research that says being face to face with someone, you know, sitting right next to them really does help. But once you're 10 meters apart, all of that benefit disappears. So unless right. you were sitting with four people with your desks put together, you know, uh, Stuff doesn't happen spontaneously. You know, if you have two floors in a building or two buildings or two offices in different locations, never mind internationally, then none of this stuff happens for free, you know, as a by- free yeah. byproduct of the water cooler. So we've got to organize for it. And we, you know, that's around creating a, a kind of heartbeat, a cadence of communication. It's about, you know, making time. People always say, well, you don't have time for the social stuff. And they say, well, when did you do the social stuff? Well, you know, that first five minutes of the meeting. Okay, join five minutes early and have that same chat on the video conference. You know, you yeah. can organize for these things, but you have to organize for them. They don't happen by chance. They do. I mean, you know what, if you're in an office and, and I think, and I hate to use the word, let's say extrovert versus introvert, but just, you know, you get those folks that are really good at networking and they just, yeah. you know, so so if you're one of those people and you're, you're in an office and you're, you're chatting to everyone and yeah, great. But if you're, if you're one of those people where you struggle with that, you're a bit more introvert, you're not quite as confident, yeah. then actually this scenario, um, where you can work from anywhere and it's it's a little bit more remote is really good for you because you can drop someone a message yeah. you can get on a video call with them um it's a lot more it's a it's a lot more in, like um, what's the right word in, engaging but you've got time with someone so it's a half yeah. an hour chat let's say right versus a five minute oh we must grab coffee you know message me da, 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 but you never do you know you have that loads in the office um also for introverts i mean we we kind of train people in running virtual meetings and one of the things that people often say to us the introverts is actually i feel like i get more more airtime in a virtual meeting because i can use chat i can raise hands you know in a face-to-face meeting it's the same old gobby people who, who contribute all the time isn't it so i think introverts have done quite well out of this whole process of the move to to virtual working and virtual meetings yeah, no, absolutely. And also, I mean, like LinkedIn is a wonderful place. It's like the virtual cocktail party where, you know, you can like someone's content, uh, you can comment, great post, then you can drop them a little DM and they'll be like, who's this liking all my stuff? Yes, I'll grab a coffee. So it's so all of this like external networking where you used to have to go to a live conference. You maybe speak to the people next to you. You know, it's quite hard, right? Like a lot of people find it really hard to go to a, a conference and network suddenly you can do it at home yeah. and so many people are happy to have a chat sure half an hour chat online yeah. we call yeah. it a virtual coffee you know where we talk to clients if i see a virtual coffee and you know you just get five minutes grab a coffee and a bit of a chat and people are much more willing to do that than can we have a sales account review meeting or something like that you know? yeah definitely what do you think for, just kind of finish off and i will let me talk about younger folks mm-hmm. um and a lot of people talk about it being different they're like, like Chen Z, uh, different. Do you think, uh, is it different? Is it just different because we grew up in a different time and every yeah. time's a little bit different? Like, what, what are your... I, I think it always was different. You know, I, I think there are, there are kind of inscriptions in the pyramids that talk about young people not respecting status and, you know, being flighty and all those kinds. So some, uh, I, in the, I book a work, I worked on remote and virtual teams just to like, 90% of the, of the differences are generational differences. You know, if you're young and you don't have experience, why would you value experience? <laughs> That's for something <laughs> you're not experienced to value. So, you know, I, I can take a lot of this with a pinch of salt. I think the thing that is different, obviously, is technology, the rate of technological change. Oh. And I, I'm genuinely very concerned, but also a little bit mystified about the, the kind of stress levels that young people are, are suffering. You know, and I, I've people in that age group in my, my family, people in their early 20s, 
um, I was listening to a really interesting interview. So I don't remember the lady who was on the, the news just a few days ago, and they were asking when did this mental health crisis started to take take off amongst young people, and she said it wasn't COVID. COVID didn't help, but it was it, it started to take off about 2010, and her best guess was smartphones. I think that constant access to comparison and social media and those kind of things, I think, has been quite damaging and has under, undermined a lot of people's confidence. Um, so that that's a big concern for me. I think that is different. I, I don't remember ever having the level of anxiety that I'm, I'm told is happening amongst young people. Yeah. It's interesting, Matt. I've had a lot of conversation about that. I've got three young kids myself. Right. Um, and I'm, you know, I think for me, like uh, being a parent and thinking about how can I help my kids navigate through social media tech and stuff and for me it's like you're focusing on trying to build their self-esteem yeah. um and confidence and resilience and hopefully prepare them for whatever might come um, i wouldn't blame smartphones or social media because it's humans that use it sure. you know and we choose how to use it and how to engage and i think you know i think for me you know my my kids are growing up in this world this is their this is their normal this is how they grew up um and i'm just gonna i guess try and do my best to prepare them, arm them, you know, whatever for, for what's to come. Um, yeah. Maybe it's smartphones. Maybe, maybe it's always been there. We just haven't really, that, that's these, these stress levels of, you know, being young and wanting to fit in, in the world yeah. and not quite sure knowing what we want to do. Yeah. It, it, it's an interesting one, but I, I think it's undeniable that the, the technology is the thing that's changing the fastest, you know, the, the other oh, yeah. stuff oh, yeah. goes, goes on around it is often triggered by technology, but um, so that, the way people interact with that. And I think work, you know, work is part of it. I think, you know, that the people I know who are in their early twenties, they're really questioning work in a way that I, I never had the, the chance to question work. Right. I, I left at home. <laughs> my parents said, get a job. Uh, well, do you know what we have now though? You know, we have, you have choice now. You so, you know, a, le a legitimate career. Yeah, yeah. So I was just saying like, a, you know, a legitimate career now as an e-gamer or YouTuber yeah. or TikToker, but yeah. you can make money. You can. Um, you know, and back, and so even back, back, you know, back when I was growing up, um, it wasn't like no. you just wasn't even. So half the problem is when you have choice, you're like, you know, it's you're half the time you don't have choice. There was, there was a great study done years ago, I remember from my Mars days, where they were looking at choice in terms of retail products, and, and they put a, they did an experiment where they gave people a choice of four jams. And I think 65% of people chose one of the jams. And then they did a display with 20 jams on it. And only about 15% of people chose the jam because it was just too much work to choose a jam. Yeah, too too <laughs> much, yeah. But you're right, like the way people want to work now, like there's a lot more people choosing like freelance gig economy, you yeah. know. I know a lot of young folks that, that don't want to follow a corporate career. Yeah. A lot of people are moving to freelance stuff. And this is throughout the workforce. And so it's going to be very interesting for companies like Mars, right? Like you mentioned, how, what do they need to do to attract these young folks yeah. to come work for them? Yeah, I, I saw some research on this that said that the majority of people who are in the gig economy would prefer a permanent role. Uh, but for whatever reason, oh, yeah. and flexibility might be part of it. Um, so I, I think, you know, that, that flexibility of options, I think, and the more that employers can help produce that, the, the better. Um, because... Yes there are positives to it in terms of variety and you know i when i first started to write the book originally i was going to call the book the portfolio life because i think you can't get everything from work work is real important we already said 40 percent of your waking life but you know if you're if you have a if you your job is an accountant it pays really well you enjoy the work but it's not your passion but you have a passion for golf or art or something like that then maybe you can fulfill that in your in your hobbies you don't have to get everything from work the more you can, if you can get all of it from work, you know, you're real happy. I, I suspect, you know, Serena Williams or Salvador Dali didn't finish work at five o'clock and go home, you know. Um, if, if, you're, if you're that kind of artist, if you're that consumed, and in those kind of jobs, and entrepreneurs are like this as well, the boundaries are very blurred between work and life. Oh, yeah. And I, I, I don't care about blur blurring the boundaries because if I'm doing it, if I'm loving it, I'd just keep doing it right now. Yeah, yeah. Is that work? Is that, yeah, maybe, but... Uh, you know, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I set up my business. I've been doing it for a long time. Absolutely love it. Um, and but it's important to, you know, I want to be in the game for a long time, you know, and so you've got to look after yourself, yeah. you know, protect your energy, whether it's people to surround yourself with, to your earlier point, yeah. exercise, eat well, sleep well, 
you know, integrate. I hate it when people say work-life balance because the opposite of life is death and everyone equates work to death and it's not a good place to be. Um, so, you know, for me, it's like integrating it because work is part of my life. I mean, it doesn't yeah. define me, yeah. but it's certainly part of me um, as well as other things. And I think it's it's a good spot to get to, I think, sure. when, you can, Absolutely. when you can integrate that. I, for, for me, one of the things that I found, my passion is learning. I just love to learn something new. And I'm in the learning industry and I'm trying to so it all kind of kind of fits together through, through look or judgment. But one of the things that I did as I'm starting to think about, you know, how else do I spend my time? Um, I, I went to four days a week, now three days a week in the business. Uh, and I started looking at different things. You know, I've got grandkids now, so it's great to play with them. And, uh, you know, uh, I started thinking about things that um, I, I hadn't thought of, you know, what, what fits my compass, if you like, what fits my strengths. Yeah my passions and interests and just learning new stuff. So I get very interested in something. I obsess on it. I read everything about it. I kind of capture it. I go and speak to people. And then often I turn it into a training program. Um, so I, I, I did this a couple of years ago. I started saying that if I ever find myself saying, oh, that's not me, then I have to do it. Because over time, you can kind of narrow your identity. And do, you know, I, I only do that kind of stuff. And so last yeah. year, I read this thing about um, a silent four-day canoe safari. And all my friends said, you would hate that. And I thought, oh, well, I've got to do it. Now. And so I did a, a four-day silent meditation canoe safari. It was absolutely fantastic. So you couldn't speak for four days? No. Nope. I don't think I could do uh, that either. <laughs> I, was, I was joking to somebody, you know, the odd word would have been useless. What do you mean? They said, well, help would have been a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so so that that kind of uh, and at the moment i'm learning stand-up comedy so um at, uh, that I, is I, that's hard that's hard yeah, yeah. I've, I've been on a training course i'm doing some coaching i've actually got my first three uh open mic gigs booked for for the end of april so uh, you know i'm, I'm wow. going through that process and, and because that also fits my you know i like to research i like to write i like to communicate so that fits my kind of compass um so, so for yeah. those that want to come see you, where are you? Uh, well, I'm, I'm definitely mind? not inviting anyone I know to the first yeah. three. Maybe once we get <laughs> to the next uh, next level, I'll start putting it on the social media. I love that, but, but you know, but, but the, the point's great. It's like you know, because we, we just talked about younger folks, but you know, towards the un- end of your career, finding stuff that makes you you know happy and productive and doing stuff. Yeah. I never forget. I met um, a client of mine, and he was CFO of a insurance company and he was like Lewis I'm retiring next month I can't wait it's like great you know might not see you so often but you know if I'm in London anytime I'll drop you now I was like cool no problem five months later I get a phone call it's like this guy so like, oh hey I thought you you know thought you'd retired he's like you know he's walking he said I was walking the dog on the uh in the hills and we lived in southern England somewhere and he saw the train into London and he remembers like month month one he's like oh I'm so happy I'm not on that train yeah. he said by month five six he was like get me on that train please yeah. you know yeah. he, he hadn't found anything to fill you know, it was up you know the whole working for for so long and this routine and, and we yeah. like routine and learning and yeah and he just didn't yeah couldn't find I anything to find something i mean i've got i've got friends who moved to the countryside and absolutely love that you know they're quite involved in with the local gamekeeper and you know walking the dog and visiting places and got lots of holidays is great um but other people i i think if your only solution is to go back and do what you do then in 10 years' time, you're still going to be in that position. So that, that's why yeah. I kind of like the idea, if you can, of dropping a day a week and then two days a week. And I, I might actually stay at three days a week working for a long period of time, you know, as long as I, I'm enjoying it. But it's kind of nice to have the time to do other things, which you don't if you're working five days and then doing life in the weekends. Warren Buffett's still going. I think he's like, what, 96, 97 or whatever he is yeah. now? I mean, yeah. but you're right. It's like to your, to, your, to your point at the beginning, to round it off, it's like people do financial planning, um, well, hopefully you should be doing financial planning, but then, yeah, this time planning of what, what am I going to do with my time is huge. Yeah. And you're right. It's not talked about as much. And also health. I think, you know, that, that kind of, um, there's a really nice book by Linda Grattan called the hundred year life, you know, and yep, yeah, yeah. for my kids and their kids, that's a realistic aspiration. And hundred years is an awful long time to have a single career or a single interest or, or whatever, single relationship, all those kind of things. And so, yeah. you know, preparing yourself for those kind of regular transitions in life. And I think having, building that capability to learn new things and manage transitions is, you, you know, we've got to have more and more of those as, as life hopefully goes on. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Beautiful place to end. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed Thanks, the Robert. conversation. Um, how can people find you and your LinkedIn, presumably? 
Yeah, for sure. I had my unusual spelling of name, Kevin, K-E-V-A-N Hall. There's only two Kevin Halls, me and an African-American clothes designer in, in Hollywood. Uh, we, you shouldn't get us mixed up. He's actually become a friend of mine because we kept getting emails oh, wow. from each other. So, so, Love that. That. so you can find me there uh, or our website, uh, global-integration.com. You'll, you'll find uh, everything that we do there in terms of the training programs around some of the stuff we've been talking about as well. Amazing. And your book's on Amazon? Books and... on Amazon and all good, as they say, all good booksellers and a few lousy ones as well. Love it. Thank you so much. Great to chat. Great to chat. I really appreciate it.